Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Karen Lawrenson. I'm with the Open Education Network and today we're joined by Christina Tromp from the COCO Foundation who will demo the new Open Textbook Planner and Katita, an open source publishing platform. We're delighted that you could join us today. We know you are all very busy and I uh, just wanna take this opportunity to thank you for all of the work you do to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. So I have about five minutes of preamble here uh, just to kind of set the context and then I'll hand things over to Christina. So as many of you know, since you are involved in publishing open textbooks and involved in the open education community, we are committed to supporting multiple pathways to writing and publishing open textbooks because we are made up of a broad community of users and institutions. And together we know there are many, many ways to publish a book and we work to offer options for the many different contexts in which publishing happens. For example, we work with Pressbooks, Scribe, and Manifold, each of which support the open education community in their own way. And really, uh, at the end of the day, our goal is to support you, the human beings who support open textbook authors and manage publishing programs at your library and institution. And sort of um, just taking that a little bit further, very broadly, our vision is to support anyone who wants to publish an open textbook including those authors who are institutions with fewer resources. And we really started to explore how the OEN can provide access to publishing infrastructure in the last couple of years for those, for example, who may not be able to provide their own instance of a platform. And one of the ways we've been um, exploring this is with the Manifold pilot, for example, and uh, please look for an update about the Manifold pilot coming uh, in the next couple months. We think that Katita and the Open Textbook Planner are exciting additions to the existing publishing pathways. Uh, it's really easy to equate publishing with a tool or platform, but everyone here knows that publishing is a really human process. And by human, I mean it can be emotional, it can be messy, and even the best tool in the world won't make writing a book a quick, easy, simple thing for most people. And um, that reality is really a key reason why our community is so important. And time and again, it's really um, exciting and encouraging to see how all of you support one another in a variety of, in a variety of ways, because it's so critical to the work that we're all doing, regardless of the cool tools that are out there. So with that said, these are really cool tools. Uh, Katita makes beautiful books, and for any of you who are at the library publishing forum session last week, you'll have to uh, sit through this little part again, but um, I just want to just say a word on behalf of beauty. Um, and while beauty is in the eye of the beholder, I think most of us would agree a beautiful book is really a pleasure to read. It presents the story and information in a consistent and engaging way that guides the reader on a journey. And maybe that journey is through time or science or space or history. Whatever the subject, most authors are interested in structuring that journey for their reader the best they can. And that's especially true for textbooks. Um, being beautiful means being well-designed and being well-designed means working well for the purpose at hand. So beauty, in my opinion, is not really a bonus. Uh, we all deserve beauty, including students who are using open educational resources and the faculty and instructors and students who spend their time making those resources. So with that said, a little background about this project. We started working with the COCO Foundation in 2019 uh, with an IMLS grant and an advisory group of eight OEN members who were committed to developing support for authors who want to create a consistent structured textbook. Thanks to everyone who was involved for their contributions. The idea that we went into was really to create a tool to support authors in structuring their books before they start writing. We wanted to help them select the pedagogical elements, which are so unique to textbooks, so that they could present their information in a consistent way. Um, we also talked a lot about helping authors focus on creating content and being able to really use their subject expertise while removing some of the pressures of formatting and designing a book. So in other words, we wanted to separate the content from the design so that authors could focus on writing 
and then still come out with a consistent textbook through styles rather than say more manual formatting. And this also means that something is um, uh, more accessible. <clears throat> After an author plans and maps their books in the Open Textbook Planner, they are moved into Katita, which allows people to work collaboratively on creating a book in most of the ways you would expect. After that, the author can select one of several textbook templates created for the OEN and then use those templates to create EPUBs and PDFs. And Coco is also <clears throat> developing a relationship with Lulu for print on demand, um, which I know has been sort of an ongoing challenge um, for many who want to provide uh, print copies. If after today you are intrigued and want to get your hands on these tools and start playing with them, I hope you will join us in our pilot. I'll drop the documentation into the chat as soon as I'm finished with my preamble. Uh, but really, essentially, the idea is to get a group using the tools, see how they work for your open ed publishing programs, make some new textbooks, and continue to provide feedback so that we can inspire future iterations of the Open Textbook Planner and Katita. Because although the IMLS grant has ended, both of our organizations, both the OEN and COCO, are really looking forward to continuing to learn from OER publishing community and improve the tools. Finally, I'll just say it's been really great working with Christina, also with Adam Hyde, Dione Mentis, and others at COCO for many reasons, including they're also quite committed to community and community development. And so I'm going to hand things over to Christina. She's going to show you the specifics of what I've been talking about so far. Um, as I mentioned before we started formally recording the session, please, as you come up with your questions, drop them in the chat, use the Q&A. I will keep my eye on um, both and we'll pause periodically to address whatever comes up. Christina Tromp is a project manager with the COCO Foundation. She's gonna demonstrate the Open Textbook Planner and Katita. Christina, we're so excited you're here and over to you. Thanks, Karen. Um, if anyone can't see my screen, please let me know. But here I am inside Katita on the dashboard. I've just got one book here for the moment. Um, I've already created a sample book, so we have a bunch of content to demo with today. But since we do want to really focus on how you can plan your book and structure it right from the start, I'm going to add a new book and show you how you can plan Katita in Katita. So Katita is an open source tool. Um, this instance is being hosted through the OEN. Um, they've arranged that hosting. And in this instance, um, we have an open textbook planner enabled that allows you to start a new book. So I'm going to work on a statistics book today for business statistics. I'm referencing a sample OpenStax book that you can find on openstax.org. Um, and once I've Kind of created my book title, which global production editors will do this. Um, we do have a number of roles in Katita, and I'll get a bit deeper into that um, later. But once a book has been created, a global production editor would typically assign a production editor who would be the project manager um, of the book. So if there's any questions at this stage, um, let me know. Otherwise, I'll show how to um, assign members right from the start. So the book has been created and now a production editor could be added who would be responsible from, for completing the book plan. Once you have created the book, you can jump into plan your book. And here we've set the open textbook planner into four stages. The first being to determine your book structure then to outline the content, add pedagogical elements, and then a textbook review before you actually jump into authoring. So this really helps to create a consistent reading experience. Um, when we first jump in, we'll choose our hierarchy for our structure. Either you would choose typically chapters with sections in them or parts with chapters and sections within each part. So for the purposes of demoing um, more, rather than less, I'll do parts, chapters, and sections today. And then I'll jump to the next step, which is to outline the content. Um, you can go back in steps as well. So in the outline content step, 
You can add as many levels as you like to build a kind of content outline. If you're not sure of your outline yet, you can jump ahead and always add more parts, chapters, and sections in the editor or the book builder at a later stage. But if you have a rough idea of what you want at this stage, it is really helpful to start building out your textbook outline for the things you already know you want. One really helpful thing here is that you can clone things. So for example, if I know that in every chapter, I want at least three sections, I can just use the clone tool to add those sections in. And perhaps I know that in each part, I want at least two chapters. So I could use the clone tool again to create two chapters in this part. And I could clone again um, this whole part, which will take over the two chapters with three sections in them. So here we go, I've cloned my second part. What's also possible is to drag and drop parts, chapters and sections if you have not such a rep repetitive or consistent um, outline. For example, if in the first chapter, you know you have four sections instead of three, you can just drop an extra section in there. So I'm not gonna make a very long book today, um, but I think we have a good outline to start demoing with. And the next thing I can do here is to add in some titles if I know what they are already. Maybe you don't know what your titles are and that's fine, you can add them at the editing step. But if you do know what they are, you could put them in here. So I'm gonna jump to um, one of my PDFs and jump to um, the table of contents. I'll get back to these PDFs a bit later. But um, my table of contents will give me what I need um, to start filling out my parts and chapter titles. So I'm gonna put in my first part. Um, I think I'm gonna just leave it at that. And then um, my chapter, I think I'm gonna make sampling and data. And then I'm just gonna grab my H2s for my sections um, for my first chapter and put these in here. So it's entirely possible to do this kind of conceptualization of what you want your book to include on paper or on email with your colleague who you're collaborating with or um, in your preferred environment. But um, the Open Book Planner in Katita does allow you to use this as your primary planning and authoring environment. Um, I have a pretty good idea of what I want in my first chapter and the sections for that. Um, I'm not sure about the second chapter yet or the second part and those chapters. So I can easily leave those blank. And either I could put placeholders and just call it chapter two for now and edit that later, or I can just leave it open and Katita will allow us an empty sort of untitled block with a placeholder that we can edit later. Um, before I move on to the next step to add ped pedagogical elements, is there anything anyone wants to ask here? Cool, okay. Um, we can always get to questions about any of these steps later as well. Um, it's of course also possible here to, to delete things if you've made a mistake um, or to edit things here. So I'll jump to the next step, which is to add pedagogical elements. We have our hierarchy, we have our outline, and now we're choosing pedagogical elements that should apply consistently through the textbook. We split them into openers, which typically prepare the learner for content and what they will learn, and closers, which typically reinforce the content that's already been learned. And we have some that could be used as openers or closers or anywhere in the text for that matter. So the nice, I think this is really the key of the planner here, it's the core activity that's really so important and so useful is that it allows you to add these pedagogical elements consistently to parts, chapters, and sections so that the learner has a consistent reading experience. It's an interesting reading experience that they're engaged with because it's not just long forms of text and things are broken up um, into ways that make sense. So here we can drag and drop pedagogical elements from the right 
um, into the left wherever we want them. So for example, if I want a content opener image at the start of each part, I think I also want one at the start of each chapter to have some you know, visual elements kicking things off. And then um, I could have an introduction at the start of each chapter, followed by a chapter outline. And perhaps I want um, some focus questions as well, um, perhaps before the introduction. Then perhaps in each section, um, or at the end of each chapter, I want a review activity. Um, I also want a bibliography at the end of each chapter. Um, let me drag that properly. And we could also put a summary, for example, at the end of every chapter before they dive into the review activity. And really it's possible to add any number of these pedagogical elements um, to each part, chapter, and section. If you do want to add more of these in later at the editor step, you can do that. If you've added these in consistently here and then you find at the editor step that in one section you just don't want, um, let's say, for example, I added a key terms list to the start of every section. In one section, you just don't want a key terms list. It's not appropriate. So you could remove that um, at the editor stage. So each of these things will appear consistently in every part, chapter, and section. And the next step will be to review the textbook. Okay, unless there's any questions at this stage. We do actually have yeah. a couple questions, Christina. Great. So, um, Earlier in your demo, I think when you were putting in the um, subsections and you were copying from the um, OpenStax book, you had some numbering. And so Jonathan asked if numbering is by hand, as in the section titles, you cut and pasted. Yeah, so um, if I jump to the next step, we'll, we'll see that numbering here. So I think you're referring to my H2 numbering um, for the section. So in this case, um, sections are not numbered, which allows you to do things like A, B, and C, or have um, sections without numbering if you like. Uh, once we get into the book builder, I'll demonstrate how chapters can be created as chapters or unnumbered components. So sometimes you want a sort of chapter that isn't numbered, um, but chapters in general are numbered one, two, three, four, and then you may have chapters you don't want numbered, so you can mark those as unnumbered components. Mm -hmm. A lot of this also comes into play um, with the templates that I'll demonstrate later. So um, templates, it's possible to add different templates um, for different numbering styles uh, that people want. So some of the templates have, for example, numbered chapters um, and the ones I have today have auto numbered chapters, but we've left sections without default numbering that gives more flexibility to the user. Thank you. And just to follow up, um, he also asked if the menu of pedagogical elements is fixed and what if there's an element I want to use but isn't listed? And Jonathan, it is currently fixed. Uh, this is the menu of elements that we came up with in the advisory group. And um, part of the flexibility that Christina has been talking about, I think will also allow you to use an element perhaps not totally exactly as it may be described in, um, in the um, list there. I think you'll find that there's some flexibility, but we really worked pretty hard to try and get um, <clears throat> as many representative elements as we could. Christina, is there anything you would add to that? Sure, um, yeah, so as Karen mentioned, you know, you could use a review activity or a self-reflection activity as a worked example, for example. So. Um, that might not be semantically completely accurate, but it will give you styling that will probably work for, depending on what design you're after, um, should work for the content that you're presenting. And also there are some ways in Katita to add custom inline styles or custom block styles, but that just requires us to, to add some more styling so that once you have a custom block or a custom inline format that 
it's fine to have that shown in the editor, but then how does that get transformed when you mm -hmm. export a PDF or an EPUB? So those styles just need to be put in place. And I'm sure um, this kind of feedback is for things that people feel might be missing is uh, really valuable in the pilot. And uh, we'll be very interested to see uh, what the most popular requests are. Absolutely. Um, related to that, Kristen asked where you put in question and answers. Kristen, are you thinking interactively or um, just kind of a Q&A? Uh, while Kristen considers that, we have one more question um, that Amy asked about copying and pasting outline elements, and if there will be a tool to import if a book is starting from a known outline, for example, the outline is in a different format like a Google Doc or a book is based on a previously published OER. Um, Amy, in short, Katita does enable such things, um, but for the pilot, we really want to learn about how this particular uh, book planner process works, and so there won't be an import uh, feature for the pilot because we want everyone to go through the, the book planner. Christina, is there anything you would like to add? Yep, as Karen said, um, right now you'll copy and paste your headings into the outline. Um, if it's easier, you can go through the planner and mm, paste your content into the document itself and make sure that heading level twos are set up as heading level twos, for example, which we'll, we'll demo in the editor in a bit. Um, but what's really useful is to go through the planner so that you can have consistent pedagogical elements. But if you re want to recreate a book here, um, you can copy and paste content into the editor and that will allow you to, you know, get all your heading levels in there. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that's about it. Great. And Richard, I see your question about um, images and I think we'll take a closer look at that when Christina gets to some of the outputs. And in short, yes, the pilot is limited to textbooks. Okay, Christina, I'm gonna hand things back over to you. Okay, awesome. Um, so now we can jump to review our textbook. And we can see we've got our parts here. I've left this unnamed for now. And we can see our chapter, our sections, and the pedagogical elements that we've added now appear consistently, making it really clear that consistency that we have. So now I'll just click build book. And yes, I'm sure I wanna build the book. So let me um, jump in here to that book. Now I have two books, yes. Yes, I'm in the right one, right version. Um, here we are on the book builder page. So I'll just do a quick overview of this page um, because I have a lot to cover today. Um, we've got our team manager where you can add different roles, your production editors who can work on the book, who can go through the book plan and can work on the book at any stage of the process. Our copy editors who edit with in suggesting mode with track changes at the edit phase and our authors who make track changes at the review phase. So um, all of this, by the way, is documented in our user guide. And um, here you can you know, assign your team and change permissions. Um, you can store metadata here. Um, you can store assets, images that you want available throughout the book in the asset manager. So you can upload images here. Um, I think the standard images are supported here, like PNG, JPEG, things like that. And we can export our book at any stage of the process, and I'll demo that in a bit. So even that, even now that we've just done our book plan, we could even start previewing and downloading a PDF or EPUB of this book just with our heading levels that we've laid out and our empty blocks for our pedagogical elements. Um, taking a bit of a deeper look at the book builder page, you can add front matter components. So I've got an automatically generated table of contents, so no more manually making sure page numbers are correct um, or updating them in InDesign or anything like that. It's automatically generated. We can add front matter components and we can give them a type. Um, we can make introductions, preface, a title page, half title page, a copyright page, for example. And if I wanted this to be a title page, for example, I might wish to put it above 
the table of contents. Um, we can also in the body, again, add more chapters and that will come through with the consistent structure we asked to have for chapters in our planning step, or we can add unnumbered components. So this is where um, the numbering comes in. If you just want a blank chapter, that's unnumbered. And of course, um, add more parts if you'd like to. Um, here we can see the first part that I gave a name, the first chapter, and then our blank chapters and blank second part. Jumping in um, to our first chapter, we can see that we have um, our H1, and that's already marked up for us. And we have our pedagogical element blocks that are empty and ready for me to start writing into. So this gives you a really nice structure as an author to start adding in content. Um, we've also got an outline section where you can automatically generate an outline of the section H2s in your document and you can refresh it at any time. Um, or you could manually add in whatever you wanted to your outline um, or you could add a leading sentence, for example, if you want that. Um, let me just undo that and leave my outline where it was. Um, I've got my sections where I can start writing into and the pedagogical elements that I added consistently to my sections are here as well. As well as my closes that I added at the end of the chapter. So now you can just start writing in. If you want something else, like for example, um, in this chapter, I want a further reading section as well. I can jump down um, to my pedagogical elements and add more in at this stage as well. We've also got things like short boxes, such as notes, tips, warnings, reminders, which you could add at any place in the text. Long boxes, such as case studies, biographies, worked examples. And display formatting, like um, author name that you might want to put at the top of the document, uh, perhaps below the title. Uh, subtitle. So how you could do that is, you know, just put in an author name, for example, and highlight it and format it. And that now has the author formatting. Or you could um, click on author and then just type into that and that will have the right formatting as well. Looking at our toolbar over here, um, we have some you know, common formatting tools like bold, italics. We've got code formatting. Um, you can highlight text and insert link over it. You can uh, do some text formatting tools like strike through, subscript, superscript, and um, toggling small caps on and off. You can also uh, transform case, which is really useful when you have to do a lot of editorial work. And you can insert footnotes that you could choose um, to put at the end of the chapter or at the bottom of the page, depending on the template that you use. We've got uh, common numbered and um, ordered and unordered lists and special characters, um, code blocks and tables where you can choose a table of any number of rows and columns, as well as our table options to delete rows and delete columns. Um, here within our chapter, we have our asset manager. So if you had uploaded any images at the book builder, you would be able to see all of the images you've uploaded here. And you can select them and choose to insert them anywhere here in the chapter. So one place that would really make sense to do is in my content opener image section. Um, we should upload an image there and insert it. And that gives you a good idea of kind of the starting place of this chapter. Um, on the right, we can also see that we have find and replace. Really helpful when you're doing the editorial work and having to you know, find and replace British for American spelling or anything like that. And we can also toggle between editing and suggesting mode, which makes collaboration um, much easier if you want to suggest changes. Um, it's also possible to comment on anything. If you highlight something, um, you can add a comment in. Does anyone have any questions um, before I leave this page? Though I will, will come back to this page, but um, while we're here. 
Christina, Michael asks if there are plans for um, including screenshots or maybe video additions to the user guide, because there's a lot of text as it is. And I will say, um, Jamie Whitman, our open educational practices specialist, um, will work on supportive documentation for our community along with the um, uh, Katita community. And then Christina has also been working on some demo videos. I don't know if you want to say a couple words about those. Yeah, so um, basically like we're doing a demo today, more focused on the planner, but we'll be uh, publishing some demo videos and hopefully going into some shorter videos for the more detailed parts of the system as well. And screenshots in the user guide is a really great idea. Okay, anything else on the page? Okay. Um, let's jump back to the book builder where I'll just cover a couple more things here before I jump forward. Um, so one thing you can see here is that we have these workflow stages underneath each component. So this is a way for the production editor who might be the project manager of the book or anyone who wants to work at any stage of the book to be able to advance the stages so they can click through the arrows to advance the stages and different permissions are different things are allowed through permissions and roles at each of these stages. So for example, in the edit step, that's a time for copy editors to make track changes on content. The review step is time for authors to uh, review changes and suggest their own changes. And then we have cleanup, page check, and final. That just allows you to have a bit of control over the editorial process and permissions, as well as giving you an idea of the status of each component so that you can work collaboratively on that. So I think what I'm gonna jump into next is to show you what this might look like once we've added a bunch of our content in. So I spent a day um, putting together a book um, using that sample content I mentioned earlier. And here I've added in a title page a copyright page, we've got an automatically generated table of contents, a preface, and I've added a first part just with the first chapter. So I'm gonna jump into that first chapter just to give everyone an idea of what it looks like once you've written your contents in here. Um, I've got my H1 that is formatted in that way. I've got my subtitle, my author names, I've added in a content opener image and given it a caption. It's also possible to write alt text for each of these images for accessibility. Those using a screen reader um, can access, for example, an EPUB. Um, the EPUB can read out the alt text if you're not able to um, view the image for any reason. We've got a learning objective section I've added in, a chapter outline, and a lot of introduction text, a focus question section. And here starts our first section um, with our chapter H2. And we've got some H3s in here and some um, terms that have been marked as key terms. We've got maths formatting. So um, we're using LaTeX with MathJax. Um, there is a lot of documentation online about how to write this, and there are even tools like MathPix where, um, that's not an open source tool, but I'm sure there are others where you can take a picture of math and it will generate the MathJax for you, uh, for those that are not willing to learn how MathJax notation. Um, but here we have a basic fraction and you write MathJax by putting in a single dollar, putting in your MathJax notation and then closing that. Um, with another dollar. So again, this is in more detail in our user guide and there's some helpful links there for generating and validating your math jacks. Here I've got a worked example and I've used that as a kind of example and then added a self-reflection activity section in with short boxes such as a reminder um, to demonstrate all the formatting and layout. I've even put some poetry into the statistics book and since it is statistics content, there are really a lot of worked examples, a lot of practice here. We've got our second section. Um, we've got more short boxes like notes. 
and more images that have been inserted through our asset manager. Some more tables. Christina, as you're um, showing this, Amy asked yeah, if please. the um, view where authors will be composing and if, excuse me, and if so, <clears throat> can the text pane width be adjusted? Um, I'm not sure I um, heard what you said about composing, but this is kind of the focus view um, in Katita where you can um, just create a more focused view with a kind of larger text area. Um, I just want to see what happens when you zoom, um, but the pain kind of stays the same. Um, but yeah, that's really useful feedback if that is something that um, people are interested in, a, a wider text area for composition. We've kind of used just the standard um, column design here. Yeah, Amy has her eye on all the white space uh, there kind of on the right side. Mm. So this white space looks like a huge waste of space until you start collaborating. Um, because this whole pane can get filled with um, comments and you have all your comments down the side and you also have um, track change, um, track changes modal coming down where you can accept or reject su su suggestions and as well as our kind of find and replace bar, which can take up a lot of space here. So that's kind of what that margin is being used for for now. Um, but in UX and web design, we are always improving and moving forward. And we're looking forward actually to a redesign of Katita. So watch out for that. That's gonna be really exciting, um, as well as the work with Lulu uh, that Karen mentioned earlier to support print on demand. We also have a couple quick questions from Cheryl. She's wondering if you can incorporate a link in the image caption. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. I think it should be possible in an image caption to uh, use the link feature. Um, so for example, maybe we can find an image here if I haven't already scrolled past all of them. Um, I can also just search for a figure. I'm not going to use my content opener image, but jump to the next one. Okay, so I'll just call this a pie chart and I can link um, my text here. The caption in the PDF or EPUB just appears as any other text. So it should be completely possible in, in screen PDFs or EPUBs for that to be clickable. Great. Um, you, you can also paste in a link if you want it actually just spelled out for any reason. And as authors are working, are changes auto-saved? Changes are auto-saved. Um, that used to be two seconds, but that wasn't fast enough for some of us. So we've changed that down to a second. So we do have a save button if you're really um, worried about uh, losing your changes, but um, changes are auto-saved every second. And then a couple questions about what's under the hood here. Um, Ellen was curious if you could switch to HTML view or code view to show how some of these elements are tagged and a little bit more about what's behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So we don't currently have um, a kind of HTML view under the hood view here. Um, we're using kind of semantic markup with the left pane illustrating what markup has been applied. Um, so we can export to HTML. That is one really exciting feature and I'll show where that is um, in a, that's the next step after this page. We'll show um, how we can export to HTML. Um, and then just regarding what's being used here in Katita, we are using the Wax Editor, which is another tool that Coco works on. Um, and that's providing the toolbar and the elements that we see here as well as the editing and suggesting mode, find and replace, comments, and things like that. And one more question. This one's from Corey. Um, and I think Corey's probably thinking about like a Google versioning doc. He asks, or she asked, they ask, is there a possibility to see previous iterations or versions 
For example, during editing, a sentence was accidentally deleted and saved. Can we access a previous save? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So version control is high on the agenda um, for Katita in the future. Um, while you're editing, normal things like um, control Z to undo changes are totally possible. Um, so we have a shortcut menu here. Most of the stuff that you can do in any, any um, text editor like MS Word or Google Docs um, can be done in this editor as well. We don't currently have version control to roll back to something you did yesterday before you left the system. And um, we, we're really interested in scoping out in more detail what kind of version control would be useful to people. Thanks. And Paul, I see your question. We'll just hang on to it um, and answer it when we get to um, seeing some of the PDFs. Okay, great. Um, so just before we jump in the PDFs, I'll just scroll down here. I mean, I think we've pretty much seen everything we've got here, but we've got some maps even in tables. And ending off the chapter, um, we have kind of those pedagogical elements that we added earlier that have now been filled out, like a key terms list section and a um, chapter review section, which I've split up by H2, but you don't have to do that. A little homework box that this is kind of the thing we were talking about earlier. I've named it homework, but I've put it in a review activity section um, because that design works for me anyway. And a references section that I've also split out into um, per sec, uh, H2 um, section that we had in the book, but in the chapter, but that isn't necessary as well as a further reading section. Okay, so now we can see what the editor looks like once we have a bunch of content um, actually put in there. And then the really exciting thing is to start exporting the book. So you don't have to finish your chapter before you start previewing or downloading your book, um, but it definitely helps to have content before um, you start exporting. So let's start in the download section um, and I'll start by talking about ICML. So ICML provides a compressed zip file, including all the images, and that's Adobe InDesign compatible. So that makes it really future-proof. And if you ever did want to port out your content and put it into Adobe InDesign to continue design there, um, you can. But one great thing about Katita is that we do have support for templates through a page.js rendering engine. So you don't need to know about that, but for those interested, um, we're using page.js behind the scenes to generate uh, beautiful PDFs of your book. And currently there are five templates with unique characteristics um, and we'll get into those in a moment. We also have EPUB export where we're using an EPUB checker to make sure we have a valid EPUB three file. And here we have two templates where you can choose to have your footnotes at the end of the chapter um, or at the bottom of the page. So you can just jump straight to download a PDF, but you can also use the preview window to just open a PDF in your browser. And this is where we get into the exciting realm of automated typesetting. Um, so I can choose a template. And this is going to open a preview window because I'm logged in as a global production editor. I have access to the CSS window that shows me the cascading style sheets that make this design possible. And here I've got my book rendering over here. So before I jump into the PDF and a deeper dive on that, just a quick note on the CSS for those who are interested. Um, these style sheets define all the styles such as accent colors, fonts, heading levels, box styles, and it is possible depending on your role to do things like change the font size for H1s here and then regenerate your PDF. Or um, something that's quite an interesting use case to me is, you know, if you had a second book in a series and you really liked this design, but you wanted to just change the accent color to red, um, you could change the accent color in one place in the CSS and have this all automatically regenerate in less than a minute. So that's really one exciting thing about um, automated typesetting. It also means that you can edit your content and come to an export of your content um, within a minute. 
you don't have to have a back and forth on an email thread um, with a designer to make a minor change in your PDF. So I'm going to open this up. I'm going to, well, firstly, to come back to the question about HTML download, um, this is where you can download your HTML. And if you do want the CSS that's used here, you can down, just grab the CSS file as well. Um, so I'm just going to click print. That will just open this up in a new window so we can see the double page spread. And now we can see it actually rendering in the browser in a couple of seconds. And if you're fast enough, you can get to the table of contents before the page numbers um, fill themselves out. Um, so those are all generated um, automatically. So they are always correct. Um, so here we are in our first template. Um, this is the Apollo template. I actually have that one open here too. And this one is using um, kind of a blue accent color it's got a larger page size than some of the others, so we can make use of things like sidebar elements for our short boxes. Um, we have a sans serif font for the H1. We've got our figure caption for our figure opener in the lower right-hand corner, and we've got uh, running footers for the titles and these page numbers on the outer corner. So that's just one of the templates, and um, really you can. There's, there's a number of features. I mean, I could go on about this template for a long time. Um, we've got our math rendering, our tables, um, our key terms list, just to show a few things, our chapter review in a double column design, and our references also in a double column design with this accent color as a shading um, behind the references page. And then our empty part that we've added, we can see the empty placeholder part title there and we can you know, fill that in as well as our, our end matter. Um, uh, basically from here, you can go back to the book and you wanna try out a different template. Um, you can just try another one and do the same thing. It will automatically generate in the browser in a minute. Um, so I've already done this for five of them. And the next one I'll show, um, let me just scroll back to the top, is called Aphrodite. And this is a bit of a smaller page size and it's more of a funky design, maybe more appropriate for a humanity subject. We've got our table of contents and some front matter. Our part page opener. And our chapter opener where in this case, we've got our figure caption um, displaying on the opener image. Obviously, we've got a different accent color here. Now we have serif font being used on the H1, for example. We've Our page numbers are now centered at the bottom of the page. And we've got our mass rendering and, and all the usual stuff. Um, our short boxes are now within the main column of text because we don't have a huge sidebar to play with as we did in the bigger page size. And kind of scrolling down, we have our same images that we input. Um, and I really think these designs are really beautiful and they have a lot of unique characteristics. Here we have our long boxes that now have shading. And I just wanna jump down. Um, some of our other long boxes just have a line delineating where they start and end. And we've got our key terms list and um, our chapter review, which again has the squiggly lines, as well as our references and I'll further reading. Okay, I'm gonna quickly jump to these other templates so I can leave time for more questions. Um, this one, Demeter uses this green accent color and has a lot of these sort of green blocks on H2s and things like that. Here we have kind of running headers this time. The usual stuff like our math rendering is all there. Um, we've also got gray shading in this case. We have sidebar elements again, since the page size is bigger. And let me jump to um, Gaia, where I can again scroll to the top because I've been scrolling through these before I started demoing. Um, Gaia has a lot of these kind of rounded elements and CSS designs actually putting in some designs there. 
um, we've got our table of contents and our front matter already showing these kind of rounded circular shading elements. Our part page design and our chapter opener page with the rounded corners on all the boxes. Each of them can use different fonts and different combinations of serif and sans serif fonts for things like boxes and um, headings. And here we've got kind of a dotted line delineating where the longer boxes start and end and our sidebar elements again with the rounded elements. And these long boxes, I really like these um, that have shading stretching across the page. And then the last template I want to show today before I take some more questions. So again, I'll scroll up. Um, you don't have to scroll up. I had just scrolled down after exporting them. So they do open on the first page when you generate them. Again, here we have some CSS design happening. And here we've got um, running headers with this line ending in the page number on the top of the page. Our part page opener, our chapter opener. Shading on boxes, sidebar elements using kind of a thicker block um, on the outer corner. So you can really see how each of these has a bit of a different style. And the automated typesetting lays things out, analyzes the HTML, combines that with CSS using the PageJS rendering engine, which is none, none of that stuff you have to worry about. You author your content um, through the planner and into the editor and choose a template and see which design works best for your book. And then you can choose um, which one you want to use to actually print out your book. So these are just the PDF templates. Um, there are EPUB templates as well that admittedly aren't as beautiful as the PDF templates. Um, something we're also interested in is matching these PDF templates uh, to EPUB templates as well. So you could have the same design or quite similar at least because not as much as possible in EPUB, um, but have the same design um, in your EPUB as well, at least to represent uh, the character of the design you've chosen. Great, thank you, Christina. We have a few questions, and if we don't get to all of them, um, I will uh, put my email address in the chat so that we can um, continue the conversation. Speaking of EPUBs, Corey asked if the EPUB export is a reflowable EPUB, and if so, where the sidebars appear, are they anchored so they appear along, <clears throat> excuse me, along with the related content? Mm -hmm. So I believe that it's a reflowable EPUB so that uh, depending on the size of your EPUB reader or the size of the window within you using within which you're using an EPUB reader, the content simply reflows and we haven't got as complex design elements there. So if you created a short box in the editor, that will still be a short box, but we don't have um, these exact templates like here, for example, we have sidebar elements. So these sidebar elements appear in the main flow of text in the exact position they were placed in in the editor when putting them into EPUB export. And I imagine if we did adapt these PDF templates for EPUB as well, so we do have two EPUB templates available, but for example, if we tried to match this exact PDF template for EPUB, um, we would likely put this in uh, the main text but um, I'm the project manager of Katita, so I'm always interested to hear what our page JS gurus at Coco and our external designers and those who are really interested in print media, who know a lot more um, than I do about developing for print media, um, what they have to say about that, and they do love a challenge. So yeah, we'll see if sidebar elements make it into EPUB or if they just get into the main text. And then back to Paul, I think we may have addressed your question. Um, Paul asked if it's possible to have a book whose layout and organization can be customized for a specific purpose. For example, I have a linear algebra primer that I use for several classes, but I use different sections and modify the order a little depending on the class. Or I think the open intro stats project has three different layouts for the same content depending on the focus of a class. So you could use, um, 
<clears throat> some of the different templates that Christina showed. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything more that may address that particular question. Uh, let me know, yeah. Paul. Yeah, if you have more more in your mind about that. And then Cindy asks about accessibility. Can you speak uh, briefly to accessibility features? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, in designing these templates, we actually, I mean, with automated typesetting, it's easy to frame it as in, you don't need a designer to go back and forth and make changes to your PDF. But um, as Karen mentioned, design is so important, not just because of the beauty and the enriching experience of engaging with a book, um, but also for things like accessibility. So we made sure in the initial design that um, the color palettes used were WCAG 2.1 AA compliant, so that there is a high enough contrast uh, between the colors used for text and shading and headings and all of that stuff, um, so that when they're printed at their page size, that they are um, accessible to that standard. And then, um, of course, the images aren't generated by Katita, so that's really important if you are working with something like graphs to have them be accessible. Um, I can't speak to the accessibility of these graphs in particular, but there are you know, certain um, suggestions around how you can make images more accessible in general. And then um, things like alt text, as I mentioned, screen readers can read the alt text um, behind an image in a PDF or EPUB if you have included those in the editor above your caption, there's a section for alt text. Um, if there's anything else in particular about accessibility you have in mind, um, do let us know. Great, and with a minute left, I think we may actually cover all of the questions. Uh, Amy asked if there was a two column layout um, in the template so far. I'm not sure if there is, but there could certainly mm -hmm. be one in the pipeline. Yeah, so that hasn't been um, something we've planned for or worked on yet. We do have uh, two column designs for cer certain things like the chapter review that I demoed in one of the templates earlier, but it's totally possible to create a two column layout um, in PageJS templates. So if that's something that people want, we'd be really interested in that feedback. And this is all the kind of stuff we're hoping will come from the OEN pilot to get some really valuable feedback on how these templates are working for people, how Katita and in particular the Open Textbook Planner is helping people to um, structure and author and export their content. So really looking forward to that. And um, yeah, I think we'll get some really valuable feedback there. Thanks so much for bringing that up to um, Christina. That's absolutely right. Uh, these are all of the kind of requests that we want to hear from you. Um, a web book is not one of the outputs uh, via Katita. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Christina, the emphasis is on um, the three format types um, she shared at the beginning. And so you would need an institutional repository or some other location to keep the files. Um, if this is an obstacle, um, please let me know. Um, we are at the end of the hour, so if you're looking at the pilot documentation and you have any questions about it, or if you think of more questions about Katita and the Open Textbook Planner, once our time has concluded, don't hesitate to reach out. I just put my email there in the chat. It's k-l-a-u-r-i-t-s at u-m-n dot edu. Uh, really excited to start collaborating and working with as many of you as is possible on continuing to develop these tools. Please join me in thanking Christina for her excellent and thorough demo. Um, really appreciate all of your expertise on these tools and uh, look forward to moving forward. So thanks everybody and see you again soon. Great, thank you so much, Karen. And um, just on the last note about the web book, uh, we are always seeing how we can extend Katita and we have discussions in the works at the moment of how we can integrate to have kind of web ex exports of books in Katita as well. There's a lot in the pipeline and all of that pilot um, feedback for the most wanted features will be really useful. Thanks so much everyone for joining and um, do check out that pilot documentation if you're interested. Thanks again, everyone. See you soon.